smack dab in between the two stories of the great prophets, Elijah and his successor, Elisha, right at the very end of the book of 1 Kings, comes a strange little account of a war. A war between a guy named Ben-Hadad and the king of the northern territory of Israel, King Ahab. Ben-Hadad gets a coalition together. He makes a tree with 32 other kings, and they come together to fight against the capital city of Samaria in the northern territory of Israel to defeat King Ahab. Now, as it goes, not because uh, of Yahweh was particularly pleased with Israel, not because Yahweh was particularly pleased with King Ahab, but because Yahweh is true to himself, Yahweh saves. And then Ben-Hadad's advisors come in and say something that might be sound, kind of, sound kind of strange to us. They say, Ben-Hadad, we know what went wrong. You see, we went and we attacked the God of Israel in the hills. And they live up there in the mountains and the hills. This Yahweh character must be a God of the hills. So if you want to be successful against this God of the hills, you better attack him in some other geographical location. And Ben-Hadad says, you know, you're right. That's what we did wrong. We went up in the hills. They've got a hill god. The very next spring, Ben-Hadad and his buddies gather their armies again, and they go and attack Israel on the plains. Surely a hill god won't be effective there. To Ben-Hadad's dismay, Yahweh decides to show up even where he's not welcome. Not because Israel is faithful, not because Ahab is faithful, but because Yahweh is faithful. The God of Israel shows up also on the plains and defeats the armies of Ben-Hadad. The moral of that strange little account seems to be clear. The true God can cross any boundary to save. That story helps get at the heart of what's going on in our text for today from 1 Kings chapter 17, the story of this widow of Zarephath and her son and the prophet Elijah. Setting up where we are in Scripture today, you know that Queen Jezebel has married King Ahab. She's come down from the region of Tyre and Sidon and brought her gods with her, like luggage. There's Baal and Asherah, the god of rain, and his consort. And now, all of a sudden, in the northern kingdom, there has begun to be worship not only of Yahweh, the true God, but of also of these foreign gods with foreign worship practices and foreign ways. Well, Yahweh hits the rain god right where it hurts and says, for the next three years there won't be rain unless I say so, a three-year drought. And in those years of scarcity, God doesn't send Elijah to a woman in Jerusalem. God doesn't send Elijah to a woman in the southern kingdom of Judah or in the city of Bethlehem. Yahweh sends Elijah north, out of Israel, into enemy territory, in fact, to Zarephath, a city that's in the region of Sidon. That's right where Jezebel comes from. That's the land where they claim Baal as Lord of life and Asherah as his sister and consort. This is the place where they worship those evil gods that are corrupting Israel. Yahweh sends Elijah into enemy-occupied territory. And in a time and culture when someone like Ben-Hadad can figure out seemingly quite logically that there's geographical barriers on gods. I wonder if Elijah was slightly uncomfortable going to the region of Tyre and Sidon and Baal and Asherah. I wonder if Elijah expected the God of Israel to show up not just in the hills or on the plains but in foreign soil. I wonder if Elijah wondered what God could possibly be up to in this region where he is so clearly uninvited. But God shows up. 
the God of Israel, shows up in a miraculous way to save this foreign woman in a time of drought. Don't miss the point that would have made, made Ben-Hadad wiser had he known. The miracle of the flour and the oil that will not give up takes place in a foreign territory, in a land that everyone have, would have said belongs to Baal and Asherah, not to Elijah's God. But Yahweh saves, not just in Israel, but also in Tyre and Sidon. Yahweh saves not only his own prophet, but this foreign woman and her son. Yahweh saves. His grace extends even to outsiders. God acts to save even those who seem so far beyond the boundaries of his love. As we look at that text today and see Elijah on assignment in a foreign territory, I wonder if we don't sometimes experience that in our lives too. Do you know what it's like to be in enemy-occupied territory, to be on foreign soil? And I don't just mean mission overseas somewhere, although you could experience it that, that there too. I mean, have you ever been in a group of people who's actions and words say clearly that your God is not invited or welcome in their midst? Has the multicultural, multi-ethnic world flavor of your neighborhood become such that you know there's people who are good people living in your neighborhood who claim a God who is not the God of Elijah or Abraham or Isaac or Jesus? And while your neighbors may put the coexist bumper sticker on their cars, I'll bet you dollars to donuts, they would not stomach the claim that your God is the one true God. What do you do in a situation like that? What do you do in a time in a culture when there's very real social boundaries to sharing what you believe about the truth, about life, about eternity? Do you ever feel hesitation to speak your faith or to act out your faith? Do you ever feel threatened in that kind of situation? Are you ever afraid of what the people around you might say or think because they clearly come from such a foreign way of thinking about God? Have you ever failed to act or speak like a follower of Jesus because you know you're not on your own home turf? <laughs> I remember a bumper sticker I saw in Germany once. It said, Alle sind Ausländer fast überall. Everyone's a foreigner almost everywhere. Do you ever feel that, not just in foreign territories, but in your workplace or your neighborhood or your school PTL meeting or when you meet your kids, friends, parents? Do you ever feel like an outsider? And what does that do on the inside? I wonder if we would view those people and those situations differently if instead of focusing on how uncomfortable it makes us feel to be in such internal conflict with those others, if instead of focusing on how foreign we feel in that experience, if instead we focused on Jesus and expected Him to show up even where He's not welcome. I, I know you've been in that situation where there's people you know and you know what they think about your silly religion and you know that they think what you're doing here today is absolutely ridiculous and I know dealing with them or talking to them or arguing with them can be a burden and can make you feel like a foreigner in your own home. But realize this. Jesus is exactly where he promises to show up. He's in your words. He's in your actions. He's in your house and in your life wherever you go. And Jesus desperately loves and wants to save those people that seem so far outside of his love. Jesus shows up even where he's unwelcomed, even in the lives of people that have stood up and said, I don't want anything to do with you. 
Jesus longs to speak into their lives and to bring them into a relationship with himself. And therefore, Jesus does foolish things like sending you and me into foreign territory and using weak vessels like you and me in places where we feel insecure. Jesus sends you out just like he sent Elijah into foreign soil, into enemy-occupied territory. And sometimes that simply means walking down the street or opening your front door. And when he does, when you feel that knot of angst in your gut because you might be called on to say something in a situation you feel so foreign, remember it's not about you. It's about the Jesus who's able to use even someone as weak and timid as you to reach out to someone he loves. Even someone who denies they want anything to do with him. In times of uncertainty or even fear, in a culture, in a time like this, it's good to remember what Ben-Hadad and Elijah both learned. The true God can cross any barrier to save. Elijah certainly crosses a barrier, a very real geographic barrier to go from Israel up into the region of Tyre and Sidon, in the region of Baal and Asherah, but that's not the only barrier that gets crossed in our text. After Elijah has showed up and this widow of Zarephath has offered to give him, did you hear it? It's our last meal. I was going to home, go home, bake a couple cookies and eat the cookies and then lay down and die. I mean, that was my plan for the day. Here's my agenda. But if you say so, I guess you can have a cookie too. And Elijah makes a promise and says this oil, this flour won't run out because Yahweh, the true God, is God even here. But that's not the only barrier that gets crossed. After Yahweh has acted to save, something amazing, something curious, something tragic happens. This widow's son, this widow who's depending on God and on the word from Elijah to sustain her and her son, this woman who's come into a new relationship with a God she had not known before, all of a sudden, her son gets sick, and he doesn't get better, he gets worse, and he even dies. The text says it so clearly, there's no breath left in him. And with her son's corpse in her hands, this widow comes to Elijah. And do you notice what she says first? She doesn't just complain about this tragedy or this death. She goes to the root of all tragedy and death. She sees in this event, in this tragic event, she experiences guilt and shame and sin. What are you doing here, man of God? Did you come just to bring my sin to remembrance and kill my son? She sees this event as happening under the arm and guidance of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and she experiences that God as a God of judgment, as a God who sees sin and punishes sin. She blames Yahweh for the death of her son, and she claims her own sin and guilt as the reason for that death. Elijah also knows who the true Lord of life and death really is. But Elijah knows what to do with sin. Elijah Elijah knows what to do with shame. Elijah knows what to do with guilt and with tragedy. And so he asks for the boy. He takes the corpse in his arms and he goes up to that upper room and stretches the boy out on his own bed and he He stretches out and covers him three times. He lays his body on the body of the boy and he prays to the one true God. He too recognizes that Yahweh is at work, but he takes the sin and the shame and the guilt and the tragedy and he runs back to Yahweh with it. He says, Yahweh, what are you doing? I came to live with this woman. She's been feeding me as long as I've been here. You've been using her in my life to fulfill my needs. Why are you acting this way? He doesn't cover over the widow's sin. He doesn't say, Yahweh, she's not sinful. Why are you punishing her? She doesn't, he doesn't make excuses for her guilt or sweep her shame under the carpet. 
He takes the sin and the shame and the guilt and the tragedy to the throne of grace, where he knows there's a God who can hear, even on foreign soil. He stretches himself out over the boy and intercedes in prayer to the God who can cross even the barrier of sin. And then a miracle takes place. It's not just life from death. It's God reaching across the barrier of sin and guilt into the life of a woman who has belonged to foreign gods for so long she can only experience the true God as a God of judgment. And he reaches out to her right where she lives. Can you imagine the scene when Elijah walks back down the stairs and says, here's your son. He's alive. He's alive. Can you imagine this woman's heart when she receives from Elijah this boy, her precious baby boy, who now lives again? The relief, the joy, the forgiveness, the undual of shame and guilt. She receives from Elijah the body of her son. And in receiving that body, she receives forgiveness and life. You know, what was true of that widow of Zarephath can be true in our lives, too. When we experience tragedy, and it, it doesn't have to be major tragedy, it doesn't have to be the death of someone in your near family, it can be anything that goes wrong. You cannot get the parking spot you usually get, and you can suddenly be back to a moment of judgment and experiencing God's wrath. Your guilt and your shame and your past will rear their ear, ear, ugly heads when something bad happens in your life. When you say, God, why did this, you do this to me? And your heart answers, well, I got a list. Would you like to see it? Your sin and your guilt can cause you to interpret the things that happen in your life as God being righteously angry with you, of punishing you for your sin. And our natural tendency is to play the role of victim, is to say, God, it's not fair, is to say, God, I never deserved that. Oh, I might be a sinner, but I don't deserve this God to, like the widow of Zarephath, know who the true God is and blame him for what's going on. Because when tragedy strikes, guilt and shame rear their ugly heads. But you claim the God of Elijah you claim the Lord of life and death. You have a place to go with your sin. You have a place to go with your shame. You don't have to hide your guilt under the rug. You don't have to experience tragedy as something that alienates from you, you from God. You've got a place to take tragedy and sin and guilt and shame. You belong to the God of Elijah, the Lord of life and death. You can take your sin and tragedy to the foot of the cross where Jesus himself stretched himself out to cover you, where Jesus himself made himself the intercessor, the Elijah, who prays for you from the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. When your life gets thrown for a loop, when something tragic happens to you, when you experience sin and shame and guilt, you've got a place to go with it. Like Elijah, you take, you take the tragedy in your hands and you bring it to the God who saves. Jesus himself breathes life back into your empty lungs. Not even sin can keep you from Jesus. Because the true God can cross any barrier to save. It would have been rather shocking to Ben-Hadad and his advisors that Elijah in the land of Asherah and Baal is heard by the God of Israel. Elijah's prayer is heard even on foreign soil. And where they worshipped Baal as Lord of life and Mot as God of death, the true God of life and death steps into human history to save. 
You see, the widow was focused not only on her grief, but on her guilt and shame. And although the widow knew that Elijah's God was the Lord of life and death, the widow imagined that death was the final word. It can be like that. Death can feel like the final word. The graveside of someone you love can be so obviously foreign soil. It can be disorienting, confusing. It can feel like you've been abandoned. Also, in our lives, death can feel like it's the final word. It's always been that way. It was that way for the widow of Zarephath. It was that way for the widow of Nain. It was that way for the widow of Nazareth. Mary, virgin mother, buried Joseph. We don't know when, but it was before Jesus died. And there, at the foot of the cross, she held the lifeless body of her son, her precious one, her baby. And at that moment, it must have seemed to the virgin of Nazareth, it must have seemed to Mary like death was the final word. It seemed confusing, disoriented, like she and Jesus had both been abandoned. This was her son, the one the angel said, name him Jesus, Yahweh saves because he will save his people from their sins. It must have seemed like God's plan had gone terribly wrong, that God's word had failed, that God's mission had ended. Oh, she had trusted that this Jesus was the one to bring salvation, but on that Good Friday, death must have seemed like the final word. You know, if, if Jesus had taught everything he taught, if Jesus had done every miracle he ever did, if Jesus had prayed the way he prayed and taught us to the way, pray the way he did, if Jesus had suffered brutally the way he did and died on the cross and the story had ended there, if Mary holding her baby boy in her lap in death at the foot of the cross was the end of the story, then Paul says, your faith is futile. Our preaching's in vain. You're still in your sins. If death has the final word, then we've got no future and no hope. This is how crucial it is to understand the power of the resurrection. Jesus died and was buried, but the story doesn't end there. Even the widow of Nazareth got to see with her own eyes what it means to worship the God, the true God, the God of Elijah. When Jesus stepped forth from the grave that first Easter morning, he showed without a shadow of a doubt how far your God is willing to go to save people who are bound over to sin and Satan and death and damnation. Jesus went into the grave and into the tomb to cross the final barrier, the final boundary, and bring you back out so that by your your baptism you have been miraculously joined with Jesus' death and with Jesus' resurrection. You know what that means for you? It means as you stand on the edge of the grave, It's not a boundary that's insurmountable. It's not a future that has no hope. You are going to cross the barrier of death, not once, but twice. Once on the way in, and once on the way back out. You, like the widow's son, will hear the voice of God's special one. You will hear his voice and live. Because there's no barrier the true God won't cross in order to save. Stuck right between the story of the two great prophets, Elijah and Elisha, right at the end of the book of 1 Kings, there's this this odd little account of a war. It's not a real long war. It's pretty short. Ben-Hadad and his cronies attack King Ahab of Israel. To Ben-Hadad's dismay, Yahweh decides to show up even where he is unwanted. Now, the moral of that story seems simple, but 
it's one that changes the way you look at the atheist in your family or the Hindu on your block. The moral of that story seems simple, but it redefines what you do with your guilt and sin and own personal tragedies. What Ben Hadad and Elijah, what the widow of Zarephath and the widow of Nazareth all learn seems simple, but it revolutionizes the way you view your own grave and the graves of those you love. The moral of that story runs throughout our text for today, and it becomes a promise for you and for your week and for your future. You see, the true God, your God, can and will cross any and every barrier to save you. Amen.